Hi, I'm Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. All right, we're live without Mac in three, two, one. Wow, what an episode this is going to be, Lanny. This is a great one. Yeah. And well, Mac's missing it. Well, uh, I, I tell you what. So today, Dudley, I'm looking at you. you got a big smile. Lanny, uh, you, you look uncomfortable. And then across the room, we've got three <laughs> game wardens it's in me. here. Uh, and, and these guys are celebrities, so to speak. They busted the largest poaching ring, I think. It, it, I've ever heard of. Yeah, Turkey probably poaching in the United ring. States, which makes it the largest poaching ring in the world, <laughs> if, if right. I'm not mistaken. And so we're just so excited to have you guys here. We've got Sheila Smith, if I, uh, I want to make sure I get everybody introduced and then we've got Randy Cooley and we've got Jake Guess and Jake looks like he probably could play football for Mississippi State as a lineman right now. <laughs> He's Too got slow. his eye on you. It, it, and, uh, nobody wants to mess with Jake. I can, I can, I can say that right now. So but look uh, Lanny this is uh, look, this is good stuff. And let me say this right off the bat. Um, thank you for hitting the horns for him, Richie, because we are we are really in awe of what you guys have done. And uh, but we want y'all to be comfortable here, because there's no reason for everybody to be uncomfortable. Uh, you know, <laughs> but we're a little uncomfortable being around the game boards. Uh, we can look at Lanny and see. So, but we would like for you guys to relax and just enjoy your time here in the Gamekeeper Studio. We left our ticket books in the truck, so y'all are right, good for now. Good. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, we see all the, uh, the, the all the trucks are parked out front. We're used to game wardens hanging around here, but y'all are kind of there's, we're not used to this many. You yeah, make everybody's a game stopping on the highway <laughs> and looking. I do feel sorry for y'all, and and it's it's obvious. Like any time a game warden comes in our office, that's all we ever talk about. It's like that's all y'all we... have lives outside of that. Too. No, that's true. That. Our life is pretty much what you see. I mean, you, I it's mean, a huge commitment. It doesn't matter where you go. I you mean, go anywhere, a yeah. wedding reception, yep. it's always about poaching. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, it's always. Let me ask you this. Yeah, yeah. I got this. I got um, this neighbor. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, that, those just because those trucks are green out there, they have, they have a um, flashing sign that we can't see. But everybody else can see when we pull yeah. up to a gas station. Ask me a question. Yeah. You'll see somebody walk out <laughs> of the gas station, and the all of a sudden you see it's like that light bulb goes on. Yeah. yeah. There's something I need to ask him, but I don't know what I need to ask him. But i got to go talk to him, but I don't know what to ask him. And, and they'll come and, up with the most random stuff. Yeah. I bet. Just, yeah. just, I mean, yeah. stuff they've laid awake at yeah. night just trying to come up with what? the most yeah. odd thing they can ask. Our local warden had to pull over a gravel hauler because he, <laughs> he wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't yeah. acting. I was like, Marshall, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, we pull over all kind of stuff. Yeah. We don't deal with just, yeah. just no. wildlife stuff. Right. We deal with mm. Everything. Yeah, I mean, that's the warden part of it, I think. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, we yeah. deal with like literally everything. I mean, I chased down a naked dude one day. <laughs> I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm crazy. Man. Okay. I, don't deal with just... I know right where to go first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, can, we can skip that. Well, I mean, <laughs> south, <laughs> Southwest Mississippi, where we work at, is a rural is a rural area. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, um, Franklin County has less than nine thousand people in the county. Uh, the sheriff's office is made up of maybe four officers, so. You know, shorthanded. It, so. yeah, well, I mean, that's just the, the way the the between the population, the budgets, and it's just it's not a lot. So we all work together. Mm -hmm. You know, now our administrations may not get along, but we all get along in the field because mm -hmm. we depend on each other. And you know, we're out working a lot by ourselves at night, and so are they. So you know, we back up a lot of a lot of agencies, and and they back us up. So. Mm -hmm. You know, for us to get out, and that that's kind of our safety blanket is getting out working with with the local guys. Um, we've got officers right now working with other agencies, assisting on other details. I mean, when it comes down to search warrants or it comes down to, we've helped the U.S. Marshals uh, with fugitive recovery, and I mean, it, it's you know that's that's just what we do. That's part of it. Well, I've always understood too that I mean the game wardens. Have, I've always been taught this are have more authority and range uh, than any other law enforcement officer. We have we we can articulate more 
areas to how we do law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Um, we have we have law. We're still bound by the Fourth Amendment, just like everybody other law enforcement agencies. But luckily, so far in Mississippi, we still have um, a lot more uh, laws on our side that aid us do, to do our job. Mm-hmm. Um, our management areas, different places, it's just like going to schools and all, you know, the schools. When you go on a school campus, you can be searched by school people. Well, when you go to one of our WMAs or you go to one of our, uh, our hunting areas or something, then there's certain criteria that we have to meet. Now, like I said, we're still bound by the U.S. Constitution like everybody else in state law, but we just have a little more leniency in how we can articulate how we do how we do our job. Yeah, Dudley and I were talking about that. I mean, is is you 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 would have to make so many judgment calls by what y'all are doing. Oh, yeah. It's everything's got to be so situational mm-hmm. uh, in probably every different scenario you run into. I mean, it's not like nothing's black. It's not and like white. you no. run a stop sign. You're in a stop sign. Right. Exactly. Most of our laws aren't like yeah. that. Right, You've right. got to make a judgment call. <laughs> and, awesome. and it's like the natural natural disasters, <clears throat> and you know, um, we we don't have to be activated. Say a hurricane comes through. Well, we've got the four wheel drive trucks, the winches, the boats, the four wheelers. A lot of times we're we're the search and rescue. Mm-hmm. But then when that's over with, we're also out there flagging traffic. Um, we're helping do all kind of other police duties. And there's not any special powers that have to be given to us by the governor to do that at that particular time. Gotcha. During Katrina, we basically we basically owned Highway 90 in, in Biloxi. It was ours. We we came in. We told you know basically took over uh, between us and Alabama Game and Fish that came over and helped. We pretty much flagged traffic and handled Highway 90 during Katrina for three weeks mm-hmm. to give that way Biloxi didn't have to deal with it. You know they they could go do what they needed to tend to their families, and that's the first wave of us were search and rescue getting everybody the best, you know, found or what we could do. And then after that, we went into, that's that's what we did was traffic control and and we we patrolled at night, the casinos and everything. Hmm. So it's not, it it's a job, but it's, it's you don't take this job for the money. Hmm. I, I mean, it's it's a calling and it, it is your life if you take this job. Yeah. I want to just say that this story that we're about to talk about involves, I, I think, at least 14 different people, if my notes are right, and Sheila, you look like you would you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but at least 14 different people, uh, over a hundred turkeys were killed. That you got probably more, but you you were able to prove uh, at least ab- around a hundred, 280 violations. Hmm. Staggering. And this uh, this investigation lasted almost a year. Sounds like, or maybe maybe yeah, maybe closer over to. Yeah. Wow. By the time we were done with the investigation and prosecution and getting everything ready, it was it was close to two years. For all said and done. And it traveled across multiple states as well. So it wasn't just Mississippi here. Correct. It, Nebraska and Kansas and Mississippi. So wh- while we're here, could you kind of give us just an overview of that part of the, 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 the breadth of this case? Well, we had... It started out in, in uh, Lincoln County mostly, and then once we got to doing the investigation, we realized it was covering five different counties in Mississippi. And once we got to looking at the evidence, we realized they had gone to several different states, but they mostly killed stuff in Nebraska and Kansas. And that's when we brought in the feds to help us with the case also. So that was it kind of started growing more and more from there. And once we started doing charges... It just kind of kept kept on going, and that's when we realized we had a few main players involved. And once we started digging and investigating, that's when it came up to between 14 and 15 people that were the main ones we ended up charging. But there was like four or five main subjects, and the rest mainly helped them. And we're so uh, in. does social media play a factor into y'all learning about this, or is it people giving you tips? And I'm, I'm, I'm looking over here yeah. at Jake. Where, it's, where it was word of mouth. That's how I first heard of the main individual. So people just kind of started bringing them up, right. like y'all need to watch this family, or I would describe people? it as a you start hearing a whisper in the community. One mm-hmm. person you hear a name multiple times, you start to look a little harder. Then I wouldn't say it was one tip; it was probably multiple. several tips, and it's kind of like a puzzle. Just yeah. Pieced it together, 
until another tip kind of pushed the whole thing over oh, wow. and it collapsed. We hear so much today about uh, uh, social media, about guys, can't, they can't help it. If they, they kill something, they want to put their picture on. But, but did that play a, a role in this at all? Not this particular case, really. Um, we do make a bunch of cases that way, but this particular case, it, it did not stem from social media. Yes, I said. This sounds like a, a, I mean, a, an organized turkey killing ring is what it sounds like to me. I don't know if I can say that, but I mean, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I mean, we, ha we obviously we have turkey hunting circles here, and, and we cherish this bird and everything else. But this thing looks like, sounds like it was highly organized. Definitely, Randy, can you tell us how this thing was f functioned? You basically had one guy that was. In his, in his 40s, late 40s, early 50s. And he knew a lot of the people in the community. He had a lot. Everybody looked up to him. If A lot of kids that fathers worked or didn't have fathers or their fathers had died. or And they, you know, they, they would come home, spend the night with his kids. He'd carry them fishing, trying to get them started in the outdoors. And after that, they saw what he did and, and everybody wanted to be like him because everybody talked about how many turkeys he killed or how many deer he killed or he has deer mounted all over his house and places he got to hunt. And then everybody just kind of looked up to him as a as a, a hunting role model. Hmm. And a lot of them didn't know exactly how much he hunted, uh, but some of them did. And a lot of them took after his took the traits of the outlaw that he was teaching some of them. Um, and a lot, a lot of our turkey hunters and a lot of our deer hunters, but mainly turkey hunters, if it gobbles or if, it, if they see it fanned out in the field, it's got to die and they want to be the one to kill it. And that was kind of pushed on to other generations. And, and you know, we, going back to the social media, uh, there were other people that we were able to find out during this case that were trying to get in on to basically uh, like him or get in on the hunt or uh, look at me, I can do this. You know, everybody everybody looked up to this guy as a, as a legend. And, you know, he was a poacher's legend. But wow. he, he did he did carry a lot of he did carry a lot of kids hunting and, and get a lot of people interested in the outdoors. Um, but Sometimes he went a little too far and <laughs> killed too many. Right. Um, so these guys, how did they? Can you explain to us? So hopefully our listeners that have property can kind of work to protect their place a little bit. How did they access? Uh, was it private land that they were? What was going on here? A, a lot of the land access was um, in in this area of Mississippi. There's a lot of privately land, privately owned land. There's a lot of land owned by people that don't live there whether they're out of state or whether they're from that part of the, or from Mississippi, but may not live there. So typically most people that they work during the week, they go hunt their place or go to their area on the weekends during the week. There's nobody there. Um, and we've all talked about, you know, I've, I've ran in on my years talking about or seeing people say, well, ain't nobody hunts my place. Well, if you ain't hunting it, somebody's hunting. It. Ain't no doubt. Um, and especially turkey hunting, if they ride down the road and hear something gobble, then there's a good chance somebody's going to be hunting it. Yeah. Um, but a lot of this land, is, it's in a rural area mm -hmm. in Mississippi. Uh, it's not a lot of people live around there. So the chances of them being seen uh, or the chances of somebody catching them was very slim. Unless they just happen to be on the place, and if if you're one person on four thousand acres, and somebody and two other folks are hunting at four thousand acres, the chance of you covering enough territory for you to come face to face is very slim. Um, they they were doing a lot of they had a lot of people dropping them off, uh, a lot of people picking them up. Um, one thing that that I'd say to the, some of the landowners. You know, um, keep your roads maintained where you can see boot tracks. Hmm. Game cameras are a are a tool that we use and a tool that you can use to help prosecute if you have these problems. The cell air cameras yeah. work yeah. great because I mean you can't you see the picture then if it takes their picture and it, you can't 
delete yeah. the picture or anything. It's already been sent to your phone. So sure. I, I like them a lot better than just the plain ones. And, and nowadays, you can get a cell, cellular camera for as cheap as you can get, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. regular ones. Yeah. It's just like anything else. Record your serial numbers yeah. of your cards uh, or of your, of anything you have out there. Um, whether it's deer stands, that's another issue we get. A lot of times people trespassing, they'll take steal somebody's deer stand. Well, you know, how many deer stands does <laughs> Summit make? How many climbing stands have they made over the years? And, you know, if there's nothing – Nothing identifying that stand to you on there is hard for us to identify if we do happen to catch anybody. So, you know, it's just a few few things. Now, um, there's, we've been on, a lot of us have been on for a long time, and there's people we've been after for years and we haven't caught. But it's uh, a lot of officers have said, you know, and I've, I've, I've said it myself, that, you know, the violator has to be unlucky at the same time that I'm lucky <laughs> to be caught. Mm-hmm. I can be, I'm I'm probably not one of the luckiest people. So if I do catch somebody, it's probably it just meant to be. Cuz <laughs> if it wasn't for good wasn't for bad luck, I probably wouldn't have none. <laughs> so. so did y'all spend a lot of time in the woods chasing these guys or uh, I can't imagine if if Jake ever got his hands on somebody it, it, they ain't getting away. No. Uh-uh. Uh these several of them had been caught in the past. Yeah. Um, had been charged for trespassing and had paid their fines. Yeah. Um, they just looked at it as, I mean, one of them actually told us, this is my hunting dues. Yeah. Um, when he was fined, he said $500 is cheaper than a $2,000 um, camp membership. So they just go pay the ticket and keep going. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. One, of, one of them we caught the year before. And before season, he had already limited out the year before we started this case. And yes. the, just, before, so when, did they, when would they start? February 21st, it's the first turkey that was killed in 2019. Golly. Wow. So when they started gobbling, they started hunting, I yes, guess. Yes, sir. Hmm. Well, I know there's more to this story. So we, do y'all, uh, we want to hear it. Uh, Randy likes to talk, I can tell that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he's, he's, to. he's got a talent for it. <laughs> well, he's got good information. So how did all this kind of c- come together, Randy? Sheila received some information about, uh, of course, like I said, we'd all, this branched over five or six counties, seven or eight actually, all over for years, and we never could tie everything together. So we, uh, they actually sent a video to an individual that was offshore, and pretty much, I guess the extent of it pretty much told him, there's no use you coming home. You might as well stay working because we just killed your turkeys. <laughs> so that kind of made him mad. And when he ran in to Sheila, when he got back offshore, it was one of those to where, look what these, this happened. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, um, well, after that, we were able to get enough probable cause to do search warrants. So we actually served uh, three search warrants on um, three three different individuals. One of them was a the guy that showed us the video on Easter Sunday night because we were having problems with them working. Some of these guys work off. So we found out they were all going to be home. And, you know, we hated to go on Easter Sunday, but we went and we, we took 20. <laughs> right. yeah. We had to get them home. We took 20 officers, three teams, and we split up, and we hit three different residences simultaneously. Cause we knew they, and, I mean, they were so close. Yeah. We knew they'd all be calling each other. For so right. we, little, we literally served the warrants within a minute apart of each other. Wow. That's coordination. Right? And um, we had, like I said, we had three different teams, and we went and seized media devices, uh, anything, you know, anything that would, that would contain evidence of any illegal hunting activities. Uh, I actually found uh, at one residence, we actually seized a uh, illegal rifle with a suppressor. Um, we don't, we're pretty sure it wasn't used in turkey hunting, but we, it was used in some illegal deer hunting that we had been working. Um, we, it was several 70 or 80 memory cards out of cameras, probably 
twenty five or thirty game cameras that mm-hmm. we seized, uh, a couple computers, several phones, several um, different devices like uh, card readers that had cards in them, uh, and, and that was we got the attorney general's office in Mississippi to assist us with the phones and the computers. And we all, once we got that back along, it wasn't just us. It was a captain Harrington was right there with us the whole time. Mm-hmm. We all went through game camera <laughs> pictures. We all went through cards. We all went through cameras. I mean, you're, you're, it was it was well over a hundred different media devices. Wow. A lot of pictures. <laughs> and we went through and and you know, we had stuff from years and years and years. So yeah. pretty much what we had to we just picked the two thousand nineteen turkey season. Um, we did charge some on some deer hunting stuff violations, but we picked the two thousand nineteen, eighteen to nineteen turkey season and that's what we focused on. Mm-hmm. Um, but like it was, you know, it was a couple months getting the phone information back. None of us had been trained <laughs> on any of that. So we spent about once a week, we'd spend at the attorney general's office worrying them, <laughs> trying to get them to show us how to use this stuff. Um, and it was a learning experience for the agency and for us because uh, none of us had ever done anything like this. Hey, this is Mac. Checking game cameras is one of the many pleasures I get from gamekeeping. OnX helps keep track of my camera locations to be sure I'm getting the information that I need to make the best decisions for the wildlife. Try it out for yourself and see. Use coupon code Mossy Oak to save 20% on your OnX subscriptions. Know where you stand. So these guys okay. would get dropped off, and then somebody would they would text, and somebody would come back and pick them up. And y'all probably had access to those texts then, it, it, right? Afterwards, and be able to. Ba- basically, they were. Um, we talked a few minutes ago about how this guy was kind of the head of everything. He would literally. They were people would text them at eight nine eight o'clock nine o'clock at night, trying to get into this little group and say. Uh, do you need to be? Do you need a cast out, or do you need to be dropped off, or do you need a pickup? There was folks that would send in information. There's there's one, there's one with at least an inch and a half spur blowed up at so and so's field. You know, and it just it was unreal the amount of information that was rolling in. But they always had at least two to three people. Backup mm-hmm. that could pick them up. They, they'd message you. Got anybody to drop us out in the morning? Yeah. No, so and so can't. Hey, call yeah. this person. Yeah, they said they'd drop us out. They they just yeah. back and forth. If one didn't have somebody, the other one find somebody yeah. to drop them out. Did mm-hmm. they were these drop off and pickups? Were they anything beyond just a normal drop off and pickup? Was it really early in the morning or they get there before daylight? Yeah, they they it was a it was a um, it was a well planned out event. They would have somewhere that they would have permission to, to park a truck. They would park a truck at that place to where somebody thought they were hunting there. Then they would have somebody pick them up and take them to wherever they wanted to hunt. And then when they got through hunting, they would they would either call somebody or text them or so, some type of correspondence, whether it was social media, or Snapchat, or any any one of those formats, we need somebody to come pick us up. It got to the point to where look for the Sonic Cup in the road or look for the limb in the road next to a tire. Um, you know you know the drill when you get here, kill the motor and roll the windows down. <laughs> I mean, it, it was not, it wasn't one of those fly-by-night things mm-hmm. to where, you know, um, we all sitting around drinking cold beer and decide, like Let's go to this here. man's place and yeah, kill turkeys turkey. in the morning. Wow. This was a plotted out from all year long deal. Mm-hmm. And they there was they went to several of the several same places they pretty much went over the years. They would start out and this was something we, we found just we just could not understand, but it makes sense. They would start out the first of the season 
close to their houses on areas that they were still trespassing, but they would start out close to their houses. And as the season progressed, they started branching out to the other counties. Hmm. Um, they didn't come to my county that much simply because of the National Forest. And if y'all hunted National Forest birds, <laughs> they're not nothing like private land birds. <laughs> they gobble in a hole and then that way... And then run the other way. And then run the other way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but a lot of this, I mean, it was all, majority of it was private landowners that the birds weren't pressured that much. So you didn't have, you know, they didn't have to have to deal with people. Now, every once in a while, we'd get a, we would see a message to where, you know, um, there was a few times they had to, they had to call and get somebody to come get them ASAP <laughs> because uh, the landowners were after them or, um, uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of other things that they would, they would pure, they would basically, we would find a location where they were dropped off and all of a sudden the landowner would get after them and, you know, 45 minutes later, they're three miles down the road trying to get somebody to, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so it was, it seemed to be more of the game and the killing not just having to kill the bird, but it was more of the hunt and the chance of taking and getting caught mm -hmm. that kind of fueled a lot of this. Yeah, he was not not romantic hunter like like Bobby <laughs> yeah. down there. It doesn't sound like they were setting up so, and yelping and enjoying them in the sunlight. Uh, no. Would you say these people? I mean, are they are they nice outside of their illegal activity? Are they nice people that you'd want to hang out with and and have a conversation with? Mm -hmm. Go to a fish concert? Oh yeah, yes. <laughs> I, you, you would never. You you could see these folks on, on in the in the street or at the cafe or uh, at the co-op or whatever, and you could sit there and talk to them. Nice as could be, like old people, as oh, likes yeah. to be. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and all the stuff that we have. I mean, I've I've run into I've I've ran into a couple of them since all this, and they sit there. And, I mean, we joke about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's the time. I mean, but that's the mentality. Is that's just the way of doing business. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one thing these guys, the first, the, uh, there was a, a turkey contest <laughs> that fueled some of this. It was, they had a turkey contest in 2019 around Lincoln County. And it was a group out of Alabama. Wasn't it Louisiana. Right? Louisiana. Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a weekend team kind of like thing. Well, these guys entered this contest. And that's when they went, they knew where a lot of birds were and big birds, and they went strictly for the those birds so they could win this contest. Hmm. Yeah, that's the only time that we were able to realize that they actually went after a particular particular bird or size bird. Usually it was just, you know, if it gobbled, it died. Mm -hmm. but, um, so would they target a prestigious property within the county, a landowner, or would they just go where they felt the safest? Now there was one, a certain landowner, too, in Lincoln County that everybody knew about, and they would go to that one. They talked about it several times. In fact, there was one time they had dropped one of them out, and the other one, you could see the birds from the road, and one of them sneaking up on the birds, and the other one mentioned a time or two he had to drive by and run off people that were stopped on the side of the road to keep them run off while this one's trying to sneak up on them. And just, I mean, as far as an officer, I knew where they were talking about, but as far as proving it in court, you know, that's different. So I actually went out there. He took pictures of the birds strutting. And so I went out there and lined the picture up, and I'm wandering around this property going, like, where is this tree? <laughs> and I actually found and lined it up, you know, two years later where he actually sat. And I said, I sat there a minute and went, I don't know if I feel real good or real creepy to knowing that I'm sitting exactly where he sat when he killed that bird. Hmm. You know, because that, you know, proving it in court that, yeah, that bird was killed on this property and he was trespassing on this property when he killed this bird. But there was there was one or two properties that, yeah, they, they went to that property because they knew but that a lot of bird them, was there. A lot of them they did because they knew that they managed for turkeys. They knew, you know, they didn't go to a pine plantation or – you know, timber company land or that type of thing. They went to land that they knew. They we we never really saw other than the one that Sheila's talking about, where they said, "All right, we're going to this guy's place and we're going to target this guy." But they knew that the land that they were going to 
was being managed and the folks that owned it were managing had an active management program mm -hmm. so they knew the turkeys would be you know they would should be turkeys there or there should be you know areas there to where you know instead of just taking a shot in the dark we know there's turkeys here so we're gonna go hunt here but now there was like the place that sheila was talking they, they intentionally went there and went there because trying to beat some of the other outlaws from killing the turkeys before they could get them. So it wasn't targeted at the specific landowner. It's just he had more turkeys than anybody. Exactly. Else. Right. Exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. you know, you can tell when you, you can tell an area has been managed. Mm -hmm. No doubt about that. You know, that. if they're control burning or they're oh, planting yeah. food plots, and you know, Google Earth and a lot of our uh, uh, other other land mapping mm -hmm. programs that. You like know, on it, yeah, on that, it. Onyx. like on it. You know, when you pull that up, a lot of times you can see the food plots, and you can see, you can see areas, and 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 they did that. We found screenshots of yeah. Onyx, and they used it. They used Onyx, right? and then we used Onyx yeah. too. and other programs. <laughs> we can subscribe yeah. too. Yeah, <laughs> but they use that, you know, uh, as and and would put pins on them and send them to each other and say, "This is where we're at," and or this ought to be a good place. Yeah. Or, um and uh like Sheila said, we actually used it in court. We used on X because they used on X. So you know, we well, were we, we to, used on X. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like everybody does. So Did, were quick question, kinda of on the side on the Onyx thing, could you could you could would the warrant allow you to get to their Onyx accounts? We we could have. We uh at the time we didn't we didn't know that at the time, but yeah. like I said, this was a learning experience. So now we I really uh, need to get into McElwain. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Get us a warrant yeah. here. We'll, we'll discuss that in a minute. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 I've, got my, I've got my computer in the truck. All now right. We, we can punch one up real quick. All right. <laughs> so, so I'm fascinated by the way you described this before we got, got in here, but uh, you said it was almost like a, a mafia ring, so to speak, where there yeah. was one guy at the top, and then there were if – you, if you put his picture up, then you could connect – multiple people down below him that i guess jake i'm looking at you now you, you, you're not going to get off scot-free but so, so is that kind of how y'all put this together like we watch law and order at night and they're trying to catch these guys we got the little strings going yeah, yeah. yeah. their pictures taped to the to the <laughs> wall or anything but yeah that that's exactly what it was it, you picture a head guy and off of him um i ain't gonna say he trained them but they hunted with him they saw his tactics they um, used his tactics and pass it on to friends, family members, and and so forth. And that's, I guess, when you say ring, that's the ring we're talking about is that select group. And there's, I mean, we know of several other rings throughout the state. Yeah. It's the same way. We just don't have the goods. So if one thing I want to encourage is the public to call. Mm -hmm. um, behind every good game warden is a good community that's giving them tips because without tips, we're, I think they would agree we're throwing darts in the yeah. dark. Yeah. Um, we can't do our job. I mean, you're asking two game wardens to cover a county if there's two game wardens in, in that county. In the county I'm from, there's currently none. Well, you're such a big um, guy. I would imagine one, <laughs> one of you could cover whatever. <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. <laughs> it takes it takes a collective effort for sure. And with, like I said, without the community calling. Oh, we yeah. can't do our job, we and that's we could. We, this case is never made. We ne probably never know about it. Never know of all these turkeys that are being taken from um, the state of Mississippi, Kansas, Nebraska without one person calling. So if you see something, say something. Exactly. No matter how small it is, you say, oh, "Oh, this is small. This probably won't amount to nothing." But you don't know what we've already been told. Mm -hmm. That might be the final piece that yeah. plugs I mean, everything we've known together. About this group. But, right. I mean, the yeah. dropping off, it's hard. I mean, it's hard to catch somebody that's dropping somebody off here and then four hours a later picking hunter. them up on another road. Yeah. We've known they've been doing it. Oh, it's yeah. just the catching them. I've got pictures of this particular guy. When we got it was all said and done, I pulled it up. Well, I've got a picture of this particular guy from 10 years <clears> ago <throat> trespassing. I mean, that's that's how long. I mean, we've known about this, these some of these mm -hmm. guys for almost since I've been a warden. But, like I said, how are you going to find it? They would hunt one county. For a day or two, and then they would moved to another county for a day or two, and you're getting dropped off on one road and then picked up on another road and just moved counties. So then as the season went and we approached May, they would start traveling up north. And you, somebody said, I think it was Randy, that, that they tried Missouri, and it was so crowded they couldn't behave like they wanted to behave there. 
Yeah, they we actually they actually left in the middle of the night <laughs> and uh going going on their little uh, northern tour there. And they made it. They actually bought license in in Missouri. And uh, went to, of course, you know, Missouri is a lot of public land hunting. And when they got up there, some of the messages we were able to able to look at, there was there was entirely too many people. Uh, every time they, he said, pretty much behind every rock was some was a turkey hunter. <laughs> and um, so they decided to go to Kansas. Now, uh, a little backstory on the Kansas and Nebraska. Some of them had been up there the year before, and they had hunted a guided to guided hunt. And it seems to be kind of uh, their little, I, I hate to say M.O., but um, they actually went to Florida also. But it was the first year they went to Florida, and it seems like they when they would go, they would go pay a guide and get the lay of the land. And then the next year, they didn't, they just went. <laughs> Um, but now we had we were able to prove through the with the help of the U.S. U.S. Far, uh, Fish and Wildlife. I'll get my initials right here in a minute. <laughs> um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife that um, they actually some of their charges were from the year before. Two of the individuals worked shutdowns and had made the trip to North Dakota, Montana, somewhere, and they had hunted all the way up. <laughs> Without a license, turkey hunting. Well, one of the other groups had went and went through a guided hunt, and they had actually stayed at a hotel that they stayed at the year that we wound up charging. So they all had been up up in that area through the Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska on up hunting. And, well, then when they went back the next year, then we were able to find that in the information and we're able to find, you know, the hotel through various uh, investigative tools <laughs> and pulled it up, found pictures of them taking pictures outside this hotel or motel and pulled up on Google Earth and found the actual Connex boxes that they were taking pictures in front of. And, and uh, But so it, was, it wasn't just, like I said earlier, none of this was a spur of a moment type deal. This was well planned out. Now, they may not have known exactly where they were going that day when they got there, you know, or where they were going next, but they knew where they were, where they were going. Um, Jake was actually with one of the, the fish and wildlife guys when they interviewed one of the targets on the phone, the one that actually basically confessed. And um, we didn't know. We knew they went. We figured they had went to Kansas or Nebraska, but we didn't know for sure. But he, you know, with with him confessing and giving us more information, but um, Jake, kind of a little funny story. We showed up in this area down in Lincoln County to <laughs> with the fish and wildlife guys, and we split up. There was three three to three people we wanted to talk to. So Jake and uh, the other agent go to the guy's house. Well, he's not there, so they pull down the road and call him on the phone. So while they're on the phone, all of a sudden this guy comes up in his underwear, <laughs> drunk with a shotgun, hmm. won't know what they're breaking into and what they're trying to do. <laughs> so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife agent is on the phone interviewing, <laughs> never stops the interview. Jake's dealing with this old man that thinks they're out there trying to rob something. And the fish and wildlife officer still gets the guy to confess. <laughs> oh my goodness! Wow. So, but you know, uh, none of this was, none of this was fly by the seat of your pants stuff. It was all they knew what hotel they were going to stay at. They went up to Nebraska with the intent to kill. What was a a Miriam? Is that what what they killed? Is that what they went to? They were trying to because they they hadn't killed one, so they went up there to kill it. We had counted all the turkeys up, and the boy kept saying 20, 23 or 24 turkeys. Well, we finally told him, so how many did y'all kill in Nebraska? Oh, we killed four or five in Nebraska, which gave <laughs> us our 26, or gave us our number we were looking for. So, but they, they killed 26 turkeys um, to the best that we could prove, and I think they killed four in Nebraska and the rest in Kansas wow. in four days. That is incredible. 
And they don't have licenses. They're never buying licenses in any of these instances. One guy bought a permit um, up there in Kansas or a tag. But um, talking to some of the Kansas wardens and all, that that's kind of a what a, the violators do. Is you got to buy a license, then you got to buy a, a tag. And a lot of them just try to act dumb and buy the tag. Hmm. Um, now, we did have one say, you know, y'all need to buy your license and all that. And he went and bought a par- partial and the rest of them didn't buy nothing. Hmm. Um, what about Mississippi? Did they have their Mississippi license? They all of them, all of them, best we could tell were licensed in Mississippi, other than one day and his license had run out. But he wound up before he entered the bird in the contest, he realized his license were expired. So we had to go buy one. So he had to go buy one. But now, it license required as far as license in Mississippi, they they all had everything they've hunted, they all had what they were supposed to have. That just seems so bold to me Mm -hmm. to. You know, drive all the way to Kansas mm-hmm. and park your vehicle on the side of the road and, or yeah, whatever. Well, they, where, where they weren't parking it, they yeah. would get dropped off. Yeah. So well, even they, up there, see a they bird were playing strutting. the drop yeah. off game. In, in that area in Kansas, um, we found out there was a the one of the wardens that we had talked to in Kansas. That was his area, but it's rural farmland, and we pulled it up on satellite imaging, and it's no. a house every <laughs> seven or eight miles. And you know, um, the one of the guys in his in his confession when we brought him into the to the federal courthouse pretty much said that those birds up there wasn't like Mississippi birds. That all you needed was a crow call and a set of knee pads, and you kill every bird in Kansas. <laughs> wow! But it, it's it's it was the same. They used the same thing they did in Mississippi. It's just that was open flat land versus hills and hollers and pine trees. So they weren't really hunting them. No. They were. They were just killing. It was more of a bushwhacking killing type huh. deal. Mm-hmm. They they actually said they had a tur- – they between the, between the three of them, they had a contest going on when they left going. When they left Mississippi, they had a contest amongst themselves of how many turkeys they could kill. Wow. And um, I think one guy killed nine, nine or ten, I think was the most, but now – um, and, and they like the TSS shot. Um, yeah, we do too. I mean, they <laughs> called it TNT, but they like the TNS, <laughs> yeah. TSS shot. Yeah. So how did y'all get to 100 birds? Now, help me with that. Was that the rest of them were here in Mississippi? Yes, sir. Um, basically, we there was 26 killed out of state. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was not quite, well, among, between all of the all of defendants, it was right at 100 birds. Um, one guy killed 16 or 17. Now, that wasn't even the whole season. That was pretty much from February to we served the warrants in April, middle of April. So one killed like 16 or 17, one killed 15 or 16. Uh, another guy killed five or six. And then you had uh, one guy had killed seven, like six or seven. And then, so, I mean, amongst the... These guys 14. married. They got. They got yeah. Wives. Yeah. They. Yeah. Wives that the, let them. Not happy wives. <laughs> <laughs> they. They. they uh, were, a lot they of those. Too. A lot of them got charged too. So, um, a lot of them were active participants, and we were. We actually filed charges on them, and. So and, they were droppers or picker uppers. They were droppers right? or picker uppers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we even had a couple. Uh, they. Uh, decided they wanted to uh, try to hide evidence and. And um, de- uh, destroy evidence. So we charged them with that. And two of them are currently, uh, they pled guilty to some type of uh, bargain. With a, they pled guilty to a felony, but if they're on probation for so long, it disappears. But uh, we, you know, they, they got rid of a lot of evidence that, you know, we were able to prove that they got rid of. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, we tried to tried to make them pay for that too. Mm-hmm. So what happens to these guys? Do they lose their hunting privileges? They uh, the the federal system they the when they pled guilty to the one charge of conspiracy to commit Lacey, um, the four of them lost some type. One guy lost five years. One guy can't hunt for five years. One's four. One's or the other two or two. Yeah. Um, basically, what we did was uh, Mississippi's in the in the uh, process of basically mirroring what the federal side. 
So um, I think they're uh, talking about having meetings in the next couple of months about doing that. But um, one of the main guy, like, he can't hunt, hunt or fish or be around any hunting stuff or anything for five years. Uh, can't be around any firearms. He can't be around anything dealing with hunting. Can't go to hunting camp, anything. Uh, that that was through the federal system. So um, if they are caught, then ever how long much of their federal probation they have to serve, plus we we're gonna charge them for rest for uh, hunting a revocation in Mississippi, which is up to six months in jail. You know that's going that the guy you were talking about, <clears throat> the way he was so sounded like he was just really into being a competitive hunter with other people. That's, that's probably that's probably gonna hurt him. Mentally, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's gonna hurt. It's it's several of them because uh, two of them actually, while they were under federal investigation, <laughs> they actually went on a turkey hunt in South Dakota and Missouri. Now this was before they had been found guilty or pled guilty, but they were they had been served after they had been arrested by the federal government. So after they had been caught, they went on a hunt. They went on one they, more run. They went on a hunt. <laughs> but now when the guy was asked, and this was one of the one that snitched <laughs> in the federal system, while we he brought that up while we were in there, and his mentality was, and they asked him that, the U.S. attorney asked him, said, so you mean to tell me you're under indictment and you went with one of your co-conspirators to hunt? He looked at me and he said, well, yeah, but we were legal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, it, we did it right this time. Yeah, and we did, and they were. They did. They they bought their license where they were supposed to. But that's the mentality, you know, of of the of the violator, I guess. Wow, wow. that's sad. And I, I assume they had younger people around that were exposed to that too as a normal practice. I, I'd hope not, but that sounds like it. And we saw several from twelve to fourteen, all the way up to. Kids, grandkids, family members, church members. So, yeah, it was uh, being introduced to that way of life. So it sounds like these guys were almost like just normal members of a community that just had a had a penchant for chasing and killing turkeys. And justified it, yeah. He, he would claim when people were questioning, you know, after they found out about him being charged – um, you know, some people got mad and wanted to know what he was doing with the meat, and he said he, he was just doing it, and he gave it, he'd give it to people. I mean, he wasn't just throwing the meat away. He'd give it to people and stuff. And they were like, well, he was just, you know, that was one of the ways people were justifying it was, well, you know, he was feeding people. Mm -hmm. you know? They like killing turkeys. Yeah. Just too many of them. They obviously like killing turkeys. Oh, yeah, that was all it was. Just, so, it was like an addiction. Yeah. So when the, all this kind of started coming to light, did more and more people come forward with, with more stories that Absolutely. kind of validated what you guys had? Absolutely. The, the, several people would call and say, hey, do y'all have them on our land? We had an encounter with somebody we couldn't ID. And I think a few of them we were able to say yes, that, that absolutely. And without them calling in, we wouldn't have known whose land they were actually on because it being leased land – or something like that. Refresh my memory, Randy. I'm looking at you, and when we were eating lunch earlier, you talked about a guy in that part of the world that was calling Mississippi State, probably Bronson, you know, <laughs> and saying, "Why don't I have turkeys?" And they and and Mississippi State was coming down there, and maybe some other agencies, and was just like, "You should have turkeys." And then you all figured out these somebody, maybe these people were killing fifteen to twenty a year. Several years, these these individuals had called. They had problems with trespassing but they didn't know to this this extent but um adam butler who is our turkey turkey guy with a part of wildlife yeah hit the horns for him uh, yeah. yeah so he uh he was actually scratching his head too and he was getting called by the landowners and going down and trying to do camera surveys and they were managing the property and burning and doing all doing everything he knew he could do and reached out to to uh, other agencies and other people trying to find out why these folks didn't have any turkeys. And they could not figure it out. They planted, they spent a lot of extra money and a lot of timber harvest and different management practices. And, well, once we got in the middle of this case and got to finding out that just these guys had probably killed eight or nine turkeys off that one piece of property, 
and other folks had been up there trespassing and it was kind of obvious that uh, there's a reason they didn't have turkeys because they had them but somebody had killed them mm. yeah. so you know Adam and them were doing a really good job on the property yeah. actually it was just other yeah. people were killing their and, turkeys and, and that's that's wow. one thing we were able to show with this case is how a group of poachers or a group of people could actually change the landscape or change for the hunters no question um the, I was tell like I was telling y'all earlier. I I came in on the end of this case on the turkey part, but some of these guys we were trying to catch deer hunt, mm -hmm. and they were going on a lot of landowners' places and killing deer. And these guys would have these deer on the camera, and then all of a sudden they didn't have the deer. <laughs> so they were beginning to wonder: is disease, CWD, or or blue tongue, or any something like this has happened because they couldn't find dead deer but they couldn't find their deer, find the live deer. And we were able to come back and show that, you know, these guys were down there doing that too. And I know for a couple of years now, a lot of the Mississippi River flooding had something to do with it. But I know that two years after we caught these guys, they did not have a deer over 140 class. They did not have a, they did not have a buck that they could hunt on that particular piece of land down in that county. Because that was their regulations, and that was it was an island out there, and they they had no deer. Hmm. And now these guys have killed about seven or eight off of it in three or four years that were well over one forties. So, you know, the old we've seized a we were able to seize yeah. a couple of those heads actually back when we did uh, some of the warrants and got a couple of those heads back actually. Hmm. That I mean, mounted. you know, we we were able to show with this case that a group of people can can actually change or can result in, in, in bad things happening on people's land or, or the habitat or the the animals itself. Cause yeah, depleting the resource. I mean, that's we're all supposed yeah. to as hunters and gamekeepers, what we're supposed to be doing is making things better. Yeah. And you know, not making it worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're game hogs. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, it's stealing the resources. I mean, that's why, you know, conservation, that's why the market hunting was done away with mm -hmm. years and years and years ago. And these guys weren't selling it, but they were doing just as much damage as a market hunter probably ever has. No question. That's so sad. And it justifying is. all of it. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and like, you know, and the love was they supposedly love turkey hunting, which is the craziest thing. They didn't that's not what they love. <laughs> well, what are we missing out of this story that needs to be told? If is, is there some interesting aspect that, that that's left that we hadn't discussed? Are they still going to be? Is it they're going to be prosecuted still for for other stuff federally? No, is that, am I getting that wrong? Every everything they have been they, the federal case is done. Okay. Um, there's one county that we're that we're waiting on, um, and I think it was not very many charges on it, but yes, it's like 15 major, or 16 charges yeah. left. It's all Majority of the case is is been prosecuted and 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 done, but. Um, how did the how did the guys act or react when it was all over with? Did they did they confess or did they what, did they get it off their chest and tell you more than you knew or not not really? They, we didn't have a problem with them as far as even the night that we went did the search warrants. I think the place that Jake went, the guy actually was uh, <laughs> he actually helped them put everything in the bag. Um, <laughs> Oh, you I mean, forgot that. Yeah. I mean, you know, of course, you know, they, they, he might have had a few Bud Lights in him, too. So, yeah. um, but they didn't really, they, I mean, the federal case and the state case. Sheila's got a good laugh. Yeah, sure. The federal case and the state case all hit pretty fast. So the federal case kind of bogged down our case uh, because they were worried about some sentencing guidelines and different things. So we didn't really get to talk to them that much because the attorneys kind of got involved. Um, now one guy, the the guy that was uh, helping Jake and then put all of his stuff in the bag, uh, when we got time to, we called him and got him to meet us at the jail so he could turn himself in on the warrants. Uh, he went to telling us in the parking lot everything that went on so we had to scramble and do our documentation to, and all that. And basically, we sat in there explaining the charges to him, and he went through his phone. And Jake did a, a wonderful job. <laughs> and that's one thing about this is 
Um, you can ask anybody. We live this case. Oh, I bet. We live these people's lives. We know way more about them. We, we basically split up the three different individuals, and we did those people. Hmm. So we live this case. Our families live this case. <laughs> and But Jake knew that I mean, we all did. Jake knew the case word for word. I mean, just unreal. So when the guy, Jake's explained, all right, I charged you for this on this day. And he looks at Jake, and he's like, well, I don't know about that now. I, don't have, I, I, I just don't know. And Jake's like, pictures on your phone. He's like, well, let me look. So Jake get. he said, I can't find it. Jake's like, let me see your phone. So he gets the man's phone and shows him the picture on his phone. This is the one. <laughs> yeah, this is it. He's like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> so he goes to the next one. And he's like, well, the next day, he's like, well, I just don't remember that now. Let me see your phone. He's scrolling. There it is. He's like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> so about the third time, about, about the fourth time, he looks at him. The guy does and looks at Jake, and he said, I just don't know. And Jake look, looks at him. He said, look, man, I know more about your phone than what you know on your phone. <laughs> so if I said it, it probably happened. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> wow. But, I mean, other than that, but, you know, like I said, we, we lived this. I mean, it was it, for two and a half months close to the end of this case, we were pretty much assigned to the office. Mm -hmm. So when we went to work, we went to the office and we worked this case. And there was many a times we opened the office and we closed <laughs> our office. Our major would leave, and, I mean, we knew the— It'd be night, dark, yeah. you know, and we'd still be there. And we'd be back the next morning, and, and I mean, it just— <laughs> Putting it all together. Putting it all together, but, I mean, it, you know, if it wasn't for our families putting up with us and, you know, the agency letting us focus on this for those couple months, mm -hmm. uh, we'd probably still be doing this. Yeah. But. And and I don't think Mississippi is. A, uh, I think this is a problem in many states, maybe all the states. Y'all don't have the resources and the manpower that you probably need per county. Definitely not. Well, I tell you what, you you certainly have. Uh, we, we are just uh, we are so impressed with what you guys do and appreciative. You know, I think about you guys, and when you approach someone. Almost a hundred percent of the time, they're armed. They got a gun, and you're, and you're probably by yourself. And uh, I just, you know, I, I take my hat off to y'all you know, because uh, y'all y'all are the guardians of our wildlife and our rich hunting heritage. And uh, the the state of Mississippi, uh, the way that they have supported you guys and pulling this together, are just we just uh, I'm just very proud, very proud. Yeah, super proud of our state and agencies and everything else. There's no question about that. How can we help? Call. Set, yeah, call. Uh, yeah. Call. yeah. I mean, I can't yeah. say enough. Call. Yeah. One eight hundred. Be smart. You can stay anonymous if you want to stay anonymous. Yeah. I mean, I people when they tell us stuff, we we keep it to us. You know, people will call. I don't want my name brought up. We don't. Well, when I'm, I when I call our local one, he's like, "What, Lanny?" <laughs> <laughs> like every day. Did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> we, yes. We have that I live too. down the road from you. <laughs> yeah, Lanny, did you, you look like you were about to ask? Yeah, I was question. just going to ask for some, you know, tips. You know, landowner tips. Uh, we had a little bit of casual conversation up front about, but y'all dropped some really good information um, about, you know, your rights as a landowner in Mississippi specifically, and and what you can uh, what you can do. Like if you see somebody on your place, what you could do or, or, or ways to help with that. If you see somebody on your place and you recognize them and you can say in court that is who you saw, you can actually charge them yourself. Go down to your local court, do an affidavit, swear into what you saw, and uh, your court can help you with that. Um, all land in Mississippi is posted. Um, for somebody to be on your land, they need to have written permission. That's always a, a go-to. That way if we encounter them, they can pull out a piece of paper that says, hey, uh, so and so landowner has given me permission. Here it is on here's his signature. He uh, gave me permission for these select dates. Um, be I'd pay attention to your roads, weird boot tracks. You start seeing some odd sized boot tracks, different boots than what you wear. Or anybody that hunts, um, call say hey, I think I got somebody on my property. Uh, I think game cameras have already been mentioned. Uh, excellent tool. If it looks like somebody's excellent pulling tool. over on the side of the road or turning around at a gate a bunch. It might be somebody getting dropped off a bunch, stuff like that. Don't hesitate to call. Mm -hmm. That's the main. A lot of a lot of stuff that we'll run and we'll be eating at a restaurant uh, out of uniform, but they recognize you. They'll come <laughs> up and say, "Hey, I, I think, I think something's happening on my property." Well, if you think it, 
call. It mm-hmm. doesn't hurt um, when we, we can talk to you and if we can uh, hash it out over the phone and say, yeah, I think something's going on and well, we can start working that area. But if we don't know about it, we don't know to work it. So, And you think going. about how big most counties are. <laughs> I don't know how y'all get around to, to what you do. And never, you know, and they're in the woods, you know. <laughs> that's, I mean, that that's why they they need help intel from yeah. from non game wardens. Yeah, um, it helps. I know one little tip I do. I during turkey season, I, I kind of know where the turkeys are going to be, so uh, I shift my cameras around. To, well, no, Landy, <laughs> Landy's like, oh, this guy. Yeah. Uh, I, I put my cameras uh, to help find poachers. Absolutely. Instead of turkeys. Well, it's all, it's all this stuff is our responsibility. It's not just y'all's responsibility. I mean, the resources is a public resource. It does cross private lands, uh, but it's all for the for the good of, of, of all the people. Um, so we all got to do our part. So, yeah, pick up the phone. Yeah. Deer don't gobble really loud. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> That's uh, a tough one. I need to talk to you about Bobby later. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. I I feel like there's – I just want to make sure before we leave this that that we've – is there anything else? Is there – is there any shout-outs you you guys need to give? I I think I speak for the three of us, uh, the National Wild Turkey Federation. Yeah, definitely. That was pretty awesome. Uh, We didn't know about the award. Um, It was uh, the first ever um, award that we got, but – um, we were allowed to go to Nashville and give a presentation to, I think they said it's about 50 other law enforcement officers, uh, game wardens mm-hmm. from as far as California, South Dakota. We made uh, some incredible connections um, for future cases. Or if I didn't have a question about how California operates, I can call up a contact that I made and say, hey, how do y'all do this? This is, might be something we can implement. Um, that's an invaluable resource. And I, I, I want to thank uh, the NWTF for um, allowing us to be there and allowing us to uh, get that experience. Mm-hmm. Well, those guys love the turkeys. Absolutely. And love the resource. It was cool being surrounded by a bunch of like-minded Man. turkey freaks yeah. like I am. You didn't hear much <laughs> yelping up there, did you? I, I, hope. I, I fell asleep to it every night, and I woke up to it every yeah. night. Yeah, like a key, key. <laughs> Well, you know, at this time, there's just so much uh, – uh, uh, unknown about turkeys. There's a lot of research going on. We're, we're some, Everybody's concerned about it. There's yeah, no question it, about it. It is. But to, to, to hear somebody taking or a group taking advantage of the resource and then knowing that there are others out here doing this as well, is that, uh, man, y'all got your hands full. Yeah, they, there's so many factors that affect the turkeys that, you know, humans don't need to be one of them. Yeah, that's Good right. point. We got to help them. I heard yeah. Them. Well, I hope y'all have been comfortable sitting here. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> Sheila has not sh- stopped smiling the whole time yeah. she's been here. It was those turkey leg enchiladas. Uh, yeah, that, that, yeah. Enchiladas, yeah. The turkey leg enchiladas were delicious. On course. Yep. Sam Culler from Gamekeeper Butchery cooked lunch for everybody. And, and I, I noticed, Jake, you look like you enjoyed it. That was absolutely delicious. I told him I wanted the recipe before yeah. I left. Well, y'all, tra- he, can, he loved to trade recipes. It was people, awesome. So. Yeah. So, well, look, at this time, uh, I want to make you guys, we'd like to, we always, Dudley has a question. Somebody, some listener somehow contacts him and uh, <laughs> provides him a question. And he, and we, so if y'all don't mind, if y'all stay here, you might enjoy this actually. So Dudley, why don't you go ahead? Okay. So uh, Dana from Ballard County, Kentucky emailed me the other day and uh, it was kind of a complaint. but. Uh-oh. uh we, we got it. We got it turned around. I think I got it figured out. But uh, he said, Dudley, I planted 30 of your persimmons in my food plots. Uh, some of them are in roughly in their fourth year, and I'm not getting growth similar to what I see in your videos. Uh, this is in a well. This is in well-drained bottom ground. In fact, they aren't much taller than the tubes. I've got them spaced about 25 feet apart. Uh, in the in the fall, uh, we either plant deer radish or a brassica mix or a blend in these fields. Uh, so I, I think there he was hinting about how they you know they're fertilizing them and all right. that. Uh, what do you think is going on? And uh, so we got to talking and chatting, and turns out Dana was disking uh, right up close to those trees. Huh every year when they were preparing the food plots. And persimmons have a really fibrous root system, and they're adapted to being in uh, 
in low areas. They're adapted to being in, in higher ground. But uh, oftentimes when they're in a bottom, their roots are much closer to the surface uh, to get that aeration that's in the ground. You know, deeper down, it's really wet. And so uh, that was what we are 90% sure is going on is, uh, you know, you go through there with a disc, you're cutting up all the roots every year and it's setting it back. You could be uh, introducing diseases or things as well when you're, when you're cutting the roots like that. So uh, that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to, I'm going to suggest to anybody, um, especially shallow rooted species like persimmon, uh, to not disc around them, uh, roughly one and a half times the height. You want to not disc with, uh, within you know, that radius of the stem. Of the stem. So if it's a 10-foot tall tree, you don't want to disc within 10, 15 feet of that stem. So outside the drip line. Yep. Yeah, talk about the drip line a little bit because even, I mean, disturbing soils under older trees – under the drip line can have a, a harsh effect too, can it? Sure, yeah. Um, everybody thinks that their tap root is goes as deep as the tree is tall, and that's not necessarily true. Especially with oak species. Um, they really spread their roots out, and the majority of the roots are right near the surface. You know, just like you lime a field or you take a soil set test, you you pull that soil from roughly one to four inches deep. You know, they call that the root zone for a reason because mm-hmm. that's where. Most of the roots are so. Uh, by disturbing that, you're you're cutting them up and uh, flipping the soil over. Uh, the life in the soil kind of dies back and before it can build back up. So, uh, just keep it as natural and undisturbed as you can under underneath your trees if you want them to grow faster. So, what, it's seedlings, one and a half times, and then older trees just outside the drip line, which is as far as the branches reach. Well, you can even go one and a half outside of that. But, you know, a lot of these older established trees that, you know, they grow really, really fast on average for about the first 60 years. And and then they slow down. Mm -hmm. At that point, I guess if you wanted to get up to the drip line, that's okay. But um, I I prefer just leaving that area, you know, wild and diverse Mm -hmm. and not not flipping it over, you know. So. Thank you, Mr. Noah. There it is. I learned something. <laughs> it, yeah, I'm glad y'all are paying attention. Dudley will drop some knowledge on you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, look, before uh, we uh, we have you guys three levy bottomland slings for game you guys to take slings. back. Yeah, they're gamekeeper <laughs> slings so that y'all can take those back. But All right. But, I, I, just, I just don't know. <laughs> you know, Toxie couldn't be here today. He wanted to be here. It, just the, from the whole company, we just have so much respect for what you guys do and, and what you've done. And um, I just we just want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you, absolutely. We're huge, obviously, fans of MDWFP. We talk, brag on them all the time, but y'all do an unbelievable job helping us manage, you know, th- th- as private landowners, this resource. So we can't we can't ever take that for granted. Yeah. And, and boy, we were so thrilled that they let y'all come up here. We, we don't do. know if we're going to get to keep doing this pot. It, it surprises us every week that we get to do another one. <laughs> <laughs> At least we got we y'all think, in here. Yeah, and we think somebody's <laughs> listening to it. <laughs> so, look, thank y'all for hope. traveling up. Uh, lunch, we uh, just, we loved being able to feed you guys. We just we, – we, I just can't say enough. We appreciate – all the game wardens out there, what you guys Hey, this place would not be here without turkeys. Now, that's the bottom line, so. Yeah, that's and right. The resource, yeah. So. We want to shoot, uh, we want to be able to shoot our share of the turkeys. You know, that's, <laughs> and, so, that's anyway, that, that's, that's kind of how we roll. But, Miss Sheila, it's been great to meet you. Uh, it really has. Really. Appreciate Randy, uh, you look like a law enforcement officer. Uh, I mean, you. I don't know. I can. I can just see you getting on somebody. <laughs> I'm kind of the black sheep of my family. I'm about the only one that ain't been to jail. So the wardens where I was from were glad when I got hired. So if that tells you anything about what I used to be. So. Well, they say the best wardens are ones that maybe have had a checkered past. Well, they, I've had a checkered past. So. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. So, any, have you guys got anything else to, to we need to cover? No, nah, just thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, Thank Jake, y'all. you got anything you need to say? I appreciate y'all having us. Yeah, we're glad to have you. So. Absolutely. Well, why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Richie. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast, and be sure to tune in again. 
Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine and don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.